All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the Insect Hunter channel. Got a little update video for you guys here. It looks like we just got one person here. Hopefully some more will jump in to join us for this live video. The reason I'm making this video is because the USDA recently came out with an update on some of their permitting process and they've come up with a list of insects that are on an exception list, meaning that they are not um, going to require a permit anymore. But I have to tell you guys that the purpose of this video is not to give you legal advice. If you have questions that are very specific, you can ask in the comments and I'll try to reach out to the USDA. But if you do have specific questions, um, make sure and reach out to the USDA so that you can get an answer from them um, because I'm not trying to provide legal advice. I just want to kind of give you guys some ideas about what these changes could mean uh, for implications for insect breeders or those that are rearing them as pets and also just kind of the way that I understand them. So I guess we'll start by kind of talking about what the announcement was. Um, so I'll read a little small portion of it. So I was checking my email, this was about a month or so ago, and I got an email from the USDA APHIS, and I thought, oh, this looks like something so exciting. It was really fun to look at, not really, but um, it is cool that they came up with this update. So let's pull up this update here. All right, it says, on August 9th, 2019, the revised plant pest regulations 7 CFR 330 will take effect. This letter is trying to notify you that you will no longer require interstate movement permits for certain plant pests. So it gives basically this list of new pets um, for insects, for breeding, and other organisms that you no longer need a permit for. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll start talking kind of about that permit. I'll also read a small portion of what they say on their website as well. They also say on their website, they say, Transportation of certain organisms across states um, without permits is allowed. So let me get into the actual wording of what they say, rather than trying to paraphrase. All right, it says this. So these permits just barely took effect on August 9th, 2019. Oh, and I will do a question and answer period at the end for those of you that are here, and I'll also talk about the implications at the end of the video. So. It says, beginning Friday, August 9th, 2019, the following plant pests are permitted by regulation, meaning, and it says in, um, in brackets here, individual permits not required for interstate movement within the United States. The table is categorized by bacteria, cockroaches, feeder insect trade, fungi, insects, mites, nematodes, and viruses. And then they also have other lists of biological control agents. So we'll go ahead and we'll start talking about some of the insects that are on the list. If you want to see what the list says, you can look in the in the description of this video and the full list is there. But basically, these are insects that are now on the exception list. You don't need a permit in order to have them within the intercontinental United States or to um, move with them. So if you're moving, if I have here in Idaho one of the species and I move it to Utah, I don't need a special permit. So um, it does exclude Hawaii and Alaska. Um, but anyways, we'll go ahead and we'll start talking about that. Oh, and it also I have to say that if you import it from another country, that can be different. So it needs to be things that have been reared in captivity here in the United States, not something I got from Madagascar and shipped here. That is going to need some regulations of bringing it out of the country. But if I already have something from Madagascar that's on this list, like a Madagascar hissing cockroach, I don't need a permit because it's been raised here in the U.S. It's domesticated. So we'll go through the list now. So. First off, the first little thing that they have here in the list is they've got this list of bacteria, and um, there's just different bacteria that you can now transport across state lines legally. Uh, I know that you might have known that, but um, they're just different bacteria, I think, that are used for different experiments. Um, one of the ones that I see here is, let's see here. One of the ones I see here is some different plant diseases. Um, things like that, so you can transport some bacteria. But the interesting thing that they just added is they added 26 species of cockroaches. So some of the honorable mentions of ones that you can now have legally is the Madagascar hissing cockroach, the pygmy Madagascar hissing cockroach, um, a death's head cockroach, dubia roaches, domino cockroach. There's 26 different species of cockroaches that no longer require a permit. I think this was well needed especially for the feeder insect trade, because people are selling these things 
shipping them on Amazon, all sorts of things. And there's, I mean, technically it would have been illegal before now, but um, it really helps with those feeder cockroaches. And cockroaches, in my opinion, are not a huge threat either to the environment. It also lists a, a big group of fungi. There's a whole bunch of fungi on there that you can transport across state lines or have in your possession. I don't know why you'd want to, but hey. Um, and then we'll get into the insect section. So I'm not gonna go through every single one, but I'll just mention some of the ones that are mentioned there um, and maybe say a couple comments about each. So thing, um, let's see here, house crickets. So those are basically the crickets you go get at Petco, PetSmart, anywhere. Um, very common crickets. So those are legal to have which they weren't before, um, at least the interstate movement wasn't. So you could take them across state lines or ship them and things like that. A lot of these things just felt a little outdated. So I think they needed to be updated no matter what. So house crickets are on the list. Um, there's a whole bunch of pests on there, which in my opinion is kind of strange, like pests of different um, plants and crops and things. There's a whole bunch of pests on this list now, which is interesting in and of itself that you can legally transport them. They're probably getting illegally transported on accident anyways, right uh, right now, anyways, so they've just added them onto there that you can legally move them across states. Um, let's see, mealworms are on there, very common feeder, um, a whole bunch of different mealworm species. Uh, the polyphemus silk moth, um, so those are on there as well. Um, the oriental and German and American cockroach, those are on there now. Can you guys, can anybody hear me good? I haven't heard too much in the comments. Maybe I'm putting you guys to sleep. I know a bunch of folks said hi, but uh, I wanna see some comments pop up to make sure everybody can hear me, but I guess nobody's complained. Um, Orientals and American cockroaches, those are actually pests. So that's interesting that you can now transport these ones that are actually pests. I would not recommend transporting them or keeping them just because they can get in your house and cause some major issues. They can be a real problem for sure. Um, silkworms, there's a whole bunch of aphid species that are on there as well. Uh, vinegar flies, which um, a lot of people call them fruit flies, the Drosophila melanogaster. Um, that's now on the list of, of one with an exception. Tomato hornworms, those are another big feeder insect. Could be a fun pet to raise, very large caterpillar. Um, Indian meal moth, sawtooth grain beetle, those are two big uh, food pests here in the United States. And actually, I'll tell you a quick story about the Indian meal moth and the sawtooth grain beetle. While I was working at Purdue, we did some experiments with those, and we would take thousands of those insects. Thanks, Clognog. I know there's a lag there. Thanks for letting me know you can hear. Um, we would take these Indian meal moths and sawtooth grain beetles, and we would put them into these containers, just a small little Tupperware container, and we would seal in that container like a food container, like a new candy package or something, and we would put like a thousand of these things, like an impossible amount of these insects to see if they could get into that food, um, the little food container. So it's like a candy and like a wrapper or a new package. We'd seal all that and see if they could get in and lay their eggs and start feeding on it. And more often than not, they could. So insects are pretty good at overcoming engineers and finding those tiny little holes, just enough to get their eggs in and start feeding on it. So those are really interesting bugs. But anyways, they can be transported across state lines legally. So at least according to um, what I understand of the permit. So um, within the continental United States, I need to just stop talking because there's so many exceptions and so many clauses that need to be added. I'm just gonna share with you this list and I'll let you guys read the full thing on the USDA web website. Um, also another interesting one is termites can now be transported of certain species. I think it's the um, Eastern Subterranean and Western Subterranean termites. Uh, don't quote me on that name, but I'm pretty sure those are the ones, but you can transport those across state lines if it's only the workers. You can't transport queens because that could cause some issues and um, having some establishment, but I'm excited about that because I can get some termites from out in Texas because out here in Idaho, termites are super rare. Um, I wanna get some termites shipped to me so that I can show them off to kids and share with them um, the fun termite activity. So maybe I'll make a video on how to do that activity and stuff. But basically you just take a pen and paper and you trace like a circle or you draw something on the paper and the termites will follow the line. They, the smell of some of the pens 
um, acts almost like a pheromone that they're attracted to so they'll follow the line so you can make like a little racetrack or make a figure eight and then they'll just infinitely sit there and follow that track which is pretty cool so I'm gonna definitely be getting some of those I'm excited about that and I don't have to have any special permits to do it from um, what I understand so those are the insects I really wanted to mention I know folks were probably hoping that other exotic insects or things would be on there there weren't really a ton of other things on there that I thought were significant obviously as I already stated in the um, my previous videos you know, uh, tarantulas and spiders are not really regulated as long as they're not imported from another country. So those are still kind of on the exception list, but they're just not even listed on there. Um, there are also a couple lists of biological control agents, and this just contains different insects that feed on weeds and things. So like some different weevils or insects that like parasitize or feed on weeds. Um, so they're insects that you release to try and control weeds and kill them. Um, there's also a list of biological control agents um, that are used to hunt other insects. And that list includes a whole bunch of things like lace wings, ladybugs, um, predatory mites, um, parasitoids, wasps. So it just has a whole bunch of different insects that you can use as biological control agents um, and you can ship them without these permits. So I think this is really gonna just make things much easier and much better for folks. You know, um, the implications to me are big it's just you know this should have already been happening and really it makes even more sense um, from what I've said before of what type of pet I think is the best starter pet for raising insects um, to the Madagascar hissing cockroach you don't need a permit for it super easy to raise um, you know easy to feed easy to take care of it's hard to kill them you know you can sit there and go without feeding them for a couple weeks they won't produce a ton of babies that way but they're just an easy pet, and now you don't even need a permit to have one as long as it's already something that's in the continental United States if you're not importing it from somewhere else. So that, to me, is like the perfect insect starter pet. And I think it's awesome that the cockroaches are now on there, so you don't need to go get some special permit for that because it just seems kind of ridiculous in my mind um, in, some, in some ways. But I understand that the permits are necessary and they're important. So... Um, I'll talk about one more thing and then if you guys have questions, if you guys wanna start asking questions, make sure and write in the comment, write question in all caps and then write what the question is you have. Um, I don't think there's anybody on here right now or someone hasn't said it yet, but I did get a bunch of comments about isopods and whether those do fit into the permitting system. I'm waiting to hear back from my USDA APHIS contact to see if isopods, which are you know like what people call roly polies or pill bugs, um, wood lice uh, there's i mean there's different names for them obviously but anyways um somebody was asking about that i don't have a firm answer yet but i did check i have some friends who do permits and i have one friend who has a permit with probably 500 species on it they have like an insect zoo and on her permit she had some isopods on it so she did go into the process and she said i need to get these on there whether that's actually necessary or not, I still haven't gotten an answer. But the ones that she has on there is Armadillium, Armadillium vulgare, Porcelio um, dialatatus. I'm sure I'm butchering these names. And then Porcelio um, scaber, but I'm sure I'm saying them wrong. But anyways, um, just wanted to mention that. So if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to take a couple questions here. Um, I know it'll take a second for the chat to catch up with me on the live feed, but I'm happy to take a couple questions. I'll stick around here for a minute, answer some questions, but I just wanted to update you guys on this so you know there is a list of ones that are on there. Um, let's see here. I raise hissing cockroaches, and I'm wondering what fruits and vegetables they won't eat. Let me pull those comments. There we go, here's my old text. All right, this one is from Insectotron Prime. All right, well, I am raising hissing cockroaches and I'm wondering about, oh, doesn't want to let me keep you in the chat. And I'm wondering what fruits and vegetables they won't eat. I want to test it to see what they like and don't like. I've tried feeding them um, apples, carrots, bananas, tomatoes, um, broccoli, 
um, lettuce. I've seen them eating a lot of lettuce. I, I think um, I think lettuce is one of the best ones. I've seen them eating that a lot. I think they really like lettuce. But the key thing is just trying to keep putting fresh stuff in there. I think they'll eat just about anything. I always just leave a bunch of dog food in there so they have something to eat in case they run out of the fresh fruits and veggies. Um, but um, yeah, I would try those things. I have heard some people say don't do, I mean, make sure you get organic stuff, but it's so much more expensive. I haven't really done um, organic fruits and vegetables for them. I just give them whatever I have, um, whatever I can find, but carrots and apples, excuse me, carrots and apples seem to be the easiest. I mean, they're just easy. I just give them whatever food scraps, whatever we've been eating. I just throw it in there so they've got it to eat, but I don't worry too much about what I feed them. They, they should survive. I think temperature is a big thing. I just barely put mine into the garage. So now they're... Uh, but in the winter, I'm going to put them back into my office. So what other questions do you guys have? Let's see what if there's any more questions popping up here. What's the hardest to care for um, insect you have had or had? Um, I think scarab beetle larvae are really hard. I tried taking care of that for a while and it just was a struggle. Beetle larvae, um, like ones that are feeding on rotting logs and things, at least for me is a struggle. Keeping humidity at the right levels, I guess I'm just not super good at that. I, It's just a struggle to try and keep humidity at the right level. Um, insects that are living in soil or like living underground. I think those are probably the hardest in my opinion because just getting that right amount of moisture is perfect because if you have too much moisture then fungus will get in there or nematodes and they'll kill them and just cause problems. If there's not enough moisture then um, they can dry out and get you know they desiccate so they just shrivel up. So I think that that's the hardest factor that I struggle with is just monitoring humidity and working with that and maybe I just don't have the right instruments to do it but that's been a struggle for me working with insects so anyways any other questions you guys have I know there's a little lag here let me check on here see if there's any other questions popping up Log Nog had a comment, said, I saw some sort of larva inside of the leaves of my corn plants a few weeks ago. They were making tunnels in the leaves, so I removed them. Those insects that make tunnels inside of leaves are called leaf miners. They're actually really cool. I, I, I mean, they're a lot of pests, but basically they'll be inside of the leaf, and then they'll mine around in the leaf, and they stay within the outermost layer of the leaf, so they're protected. But, I mean, they're just mining through the leaf, and they'll make all sorts of crazy designs. You know, it almost looks like a maze, um, the things that they do. They're crazy. I like leaf miners, but, you know, I like a lot of things that people come in, and they show me something, and they're like, I have this thing, and it makes me so mad. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. That's so cool. You know, it's something that probably harms their crops or could hurt you or other things. I just love insects. They're so awesome. So, let's see if there's any more. Question, mantids won't eat when they are close to molting, but would there be any other signs to know if they are ready to molt? I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. You know, you could try and keep track of when their last molt was and try to get some sort of average number of days it takes, but, you know, I, I've never seen any real signs of just before they're ready to molt, um, at least with mantises. You know, the stick insects, when they molt, it's interesting they will grab onto um they'll grab onto the leaf and they'll almost like hold on there really tight i actually watched one molting once and just shedding its um its outermost exoskeleton it was pretty interesting to watch but um they probably stop moving i would think at some point right just right before they're ready to molt so maybe they stop eating and then they'll stop moving and they'll just get into some sort of position where they can really lock on tight with that body and hold that body on which molting is just really interesting in general, you know, um, for the most part. It looks like we had another question. 
question from Claude Nog. Ever had any sort of water bugs as pets? I tried to keep some water uh, water beetle alive um, a couple weeks ago. I found a huge one. It was probably, you know, about that big, a nice big one. Um, I tried to keep it alive for a while, but it was struggling um, in the water I put. I think you probably might even need um, some sort of specific filtered water. I'm not sure. I, I just, I've never done too much with water insects. Uh, aquatic insects, I've never really tried to raise too much. It'd be hard to get them food, but maybe it's not that hard. I don't know. I just haven't really done much with that. <laughs> That's a better answer to that question. I don't know. I think we as humans struggle to say that sometimes admit we don't know everything which i definitely don't and that's why i love this channel and all the folks sharing their comments and thoughts because you guys have helped teach me a lot of stuff you know this channel has not just been about me you guys have helped me to learn a whole bunch of um, stuff along the way so all right i'm just going to stay on for a couple uh, more minutes maybe three more minutes or so that'll give you guys a second to pop in any more questions if not then i'll just uh stand here and stare at you guys stare into the distance look like i'm <laughs> doing something on here that's interesting enough for nine people to want to be here or other people to sit and watch so All right. Wonder how long you guys will just sit here and watch me doing nothing. We'll see how long this goes. One of the YouTubers I like to watch, his name is YouTube channel is called Device Tower. He does things on board games. And um, it uh, he will at the end of his board game reviews or when he does a, a thing, he'll just sit there he will eat food he'll just sit at the end a couple hundred people that will just sit and watch i think it's so funny because people just love him and think he's funny they'll just sit there and watch him sitting he's that interesting to watch just eat a peanut butter sandwich or eat carrots for five minutes it's just funny we had one more question here all right da, da, da. just take these last couple questions from clognog and Trying to change these chat viewing options to see if it will show me. There we go. Can you guys hear me? I think Brian's saying he can't really hear me very well, so I guess we'll see. Maybe there's an issue with my microphone. Maybe I'm not talking loud enough. <clears throat> kind of losing my voice here. Okay. Inspector Tron Prime says the U.S. government passed a new thing that lowers... Sorry, my chat thing is doing weird stuff. YouTube's got all these beta features and they're just messed up. Um, the U.S. government passed anything that lowers the protection for endangered animals. What's your thoughts on that? I I don't know. It's you know it's hard to know what to do because I have these two conflicting feelings. I have the feeling of let's protect animals and let's keep them from going endangered, but then I also have you know this um, understanding that you know we have to protect humanity too and we have to try and do what's best for humans. And to understand that people are trying to make money, trying to make a living, trying to be okay. And when those two things conflict, you know, people always try to take one side. I try to think about both sides. So um, if they're lowering protections for endangered animals, I don't think that's good on this side. But um, if it is to benefit humans, which, you know, I, I don't know if it actually is benefiting humans or why they did it. Um, I could see that sometimes that might actually um, be helpful. But anyways, you know, I, I, I'm a big advocate for animals and I think we should keep them protected, especially the ones that are endangered. But to pretend like um, these endangered species laws or things like that don't affect us as humans is just crazy. You know, they will affect us. It has an effect on us. So. All right. Um, Clognog wanted to know if I'd ever try to clean a skull of some sort. I probably will do um 
some something with skulls, um, especially with like barn owls. So I go through pellets and I'll probably look at um, rodent skulls, but I need to look at using domestic beetles and then I also need to look about um, look into uh, different cleaning procedures and things like that. Because I think I'm going to use some lye or some different chemicals to sort through barn owl pellets and sort out the skulls. Looks like um, looks like we have a question from IR Thumper. I had a question about isopods. I did talk about that just briefly for a second. Um, I still haven't heard back unless he emailed me. I'm trying to see if the USDA guy emailed me. Let's see if I got an email. I responded yet anyways. I'm talking with the guy at the USDA and he's been able to tell me if things are exceptions or not. The one thing that I heard um, Mr. Thumper or Mrs. Thumper, sorry, or Miss Thumper, sorry if I don't know your gender, Thumper, is that um, I was reading one of my friend permits and they had permits for like 500 different insects or arthropods. On their permit, they do have some isopods as ones that they thought needed to be regulated and needed to be on there as part of their permit. The ones they had was Armadillium vulgare, Porcelio dilatatus, and then Porcelio Skaber. But anyways, he ba they, they basically had that on their permit, meaning that you would need a permit for those. But whether that's actually necessary or not, I don't know. Because, you know, sometimes they will put things on permit just to be safe. You know, uh, a lot of these government organizations, they were working for a university. Um, they wanted to have those on there to make sure that they we're covered, you know what I mean? If you want to make sure you're covered, then you will ask all the questions you can. You'll check with every government organization. If you don't care and you're willing to take the risk, that's your choice. I don't encourage it because there could be consequences to the environment or to you specifically for having something that's not on a permit. But at the same time, um, I understand that people, you know, might not understand this and uh, might not be willing to do that. But I don't agree with it. I think you should do the permit and fill it out. And it's not that hard, and it's a good learning process. That way you can start working into even more exotic things um, that you can get. But anyways, I'm going to take one last question here, as initiated by Insectotron Prime. When is the perfect time during the fall and winter to look for giant silk moth cocoons? I, I'm thinking of breeding and raising them. I honestly don't know. I have never looked for them, so... Uh, if you find some, take some pictures and send it to me. I've never actually tried to just go out and hunt for um, cocoons of uh, different butterflies and things like that, but you definitely could. I would say the most important thing you need to know is uh, for that species, what plant are they feeding on so that you can try and see if the cocoons are on those. I'm not sure about the actual behavior of those, but anyways, um, I think we'll wrap this up, guys. I appreciate you guys being here. If there were issues with the mic, please um, please let me know in the comments. I appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to listen and staying tuned with the channel. And if you guys enjoyed this, make sure and give it a like and uh, subscribe to the Insect Hunter for big adventures. Start small. Thanks for watching, guys. Sayonara.